Now, what are the complications of diarrhea and the enteric infections? First, we'll talk about the intestinal complications. There can be persistent diarrhea. So, diarrhea begins acutely but lasts for 14 days or longer. That will be persistent diarrhea. Second is recurrent diarrhea. Recurrent diarrhea is diarrhea is getting passive for a few days. Then again, developing loose stools. In persistent, it will continue for 14 days or longer. In recurrent, there will be a period of remission and then it will start again. Recurrent diarrhea is usually seen in immunocompromised individuals. It is very rare in immunocompetent, adequately nourished children. So, immunocompromised individuals will have recurrent diarrhea. Then toxic megacolon can develop, there can be intestinal perforation, there can be rectal prolapse and there can be a syndrome called as enteritis necroticans, jejunal hemorrhagic necrosis in which mass, sometimes massive GI bleed can also be seen. Then we have extra intestinal complications. Some of them are already asked MCQs. You might have read about them already. So first is dehydration. Dehydration is considered to be the most common overall complication in childhood diarrhea. Second is electrolyte abnormalities, which is the second most common overall complication. Then we have malnutrition. We have bacteremias. You know that bacteremias are typically produced by non-typhoidal salmonella. Bacteremia can lead to seeding of uh, pathogen in various other uh, systems and it can lead to localized manifestations like meningitis, pneumonia, osteomyelitis, etc. Local spread can cause vaginitis and UTI. Only one pathogen produces this, that is Shigella. So, which organism causes vaginitis after diarrheal episode and UTI? It is Shigella, particularly in females compared to males. Then pseudoappendicitis, like presentation, is seen with Yersinia enterocolitica. So they will have an appendicitis-like presentation, and you will have the right uh, lower quadrant abdominal pain, uh, loss of appetite, and similar manifestations even on physical examination. So it looks like appendicitis, but simply doing an ultrasonography can easily rule out the two conditions. Then exudative pharyngitis and cervical lymphadenopathy can be seen with Yersinia enterocolitica. Rhabdomyolysis and hepatic necrosis are seen with bacillus serious emetic toxin. So these are the complications that are important, extra intestinal complications. Third, we come to post-diarrheal complications, so post-infectious complications. That is once the infection is over. So you will have reactive arthritis. You know that Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli, they all have been implicated in producing reactive arthritis. One of the common pathogen in an Indian setting is Shigella flexneri. Remember, Shigella dysentery type 1 is a more common cause of dysentery. But if they ask about causes of reactive arthritis among Shigella, Shigella flexneri is a particularly important pathogen in an Indian setting. Then we have Guillain Barre syndrome. I don't need to tell you, you know it already that it is typically produced, it is associated with. Campylobacter jejuni. Then we have IgA nephropathy, again associated strongly with Campylobacter jejuni. Then we have hemolytic uremic syndrome. In Indian setting, I hope you already know that hemolytic uremic syndrome is mostly atypical HUS, which is associated with anti factor H antibodies. But if you look outside India, you will find that in the western countries, as well as Southeast Asian countries other than the Indian subcontinent, you will have uh, the infectious causes, the so-called D-positive diarrhea producing HUS. D-positive is the word which indicates HUS is associated with a diarrhea or dysentery-like illness. So worldwide, HUS is most commonly produced by two pathogens. In the Western world, it is produced, it is a post-infectious complication of diarrhea caused by E. coli. Which strain of E. coli? Virocytotoxin producing E. coli or Shigalai toxin producing E. coli, particularly O157H7. Whereas in case of Southeast Asia, you will find Shigella to be a common pathogen. Then we have hemolytic anemia can be produced by Campylobacter and Yersinia. Please, there is a point I want to highlight here. Just a few minutes back, I had told you hemolytic anemia as a risk factor for non-typhoidal salmonella. Again, it's a very easy point, but students get it wrong. Hemolytic anemia is a risk factor for non-typhoidal salmonella. It means if there is a patient of hemolytic anemia, there is a chance of him developing 
नॉन टाइफाइडल सेल्मोनेला इंड्यूस डायरिया राइट बट हियर हिमोलिटिक अनिमिया इज अ कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ कैंपाइलोबैक्टर एंड जर्सीनिया वॉट इट मीन्स इज इट विल नॉट बी प्रेजेंट इनिशियली बट वेन अ हेल्दी पेशेंट डिवेलप्स इन्फेक्शन बाय जी आई इन्फेक्शन बाय कैंपाइलोबैक्टर एंड जर्सीनिया देर इज अ पॉसिबिलिटी दैट देर कैन बी हिमोलिटिक अनिमिया इन द पेशेंट सो वन इज अ रिस्क फैक्टर वन इज अ कॉन्सिक्वेंस ऑफ जी आई इन्फेक्शन राइट प्लीज डू नॉट मिक्स अप द टू थिंग्स एंड डू नॉट थिंक कि सर ने अभी उल्टा पढ़ा दिया so then erythema nodosum erythema nodosum as you already know it's a dermatological manifestation associated with yersinia campylobacter and salmonella glomerulonephritis myocarditis and pericarditis are the other post infectious complications